My friends, today's lecture is of the most important of our discussions regarding Our Lady's relationship with humanity. We will be talking about that middle category of maternal mediation. As we mentioned in previous lectures, the most general way of speaking about this same reality is Our Lady's spiritual motherhood. But if we want to get a little bit more theologically and philosophically precise, we then enter this category of mediation. And we use St. John Paul II's term, maternal mediation, to make sure that this is a woman who will mediate qua mother, insofar as she is mother. But this lecture is important not only for understanding the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but for properly understanding the very essence of the Church. This understanding that we're a family and we intercede for each other. And these are not competitive acts of intercessory love and action, but complementary. And so it gets back to the Catholic principle of not either or, but both and, whenever possible. We will talk very specifically about the Pauline teaching that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. And we will defend that, but we will also explain it so that it gives rise to a proper understanding of things like the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, like the intercession of the saints, like the role of the angels, even the holy souls in purgatory, and even the ability of a priest of daily mass to bring you and me the Eucharist. This is mediation. So we want to grasp this well, not only for properly understanding the role of the Blessed Mother as the mediatrix, but also in terms of the life of the church. My friends, this is true in general. The truth about Mary, the authentic truth about the Mother of God, not only protects authentic Christology, the truth about Jesus, but it also safeguards a proper ecclesiology, that is, a proper understanding of the church as the people of God. And this was a very fruitful theme at the Second Vatican Council, is that Mary is the proper model for the church and understanding Mary helps us understand who we are in a tertiary way. Uh, what is true of Jesus in the first sense, again, true of Our Lady in the second sense, true of us as the people of God in the third sense. Okay, let's get to the task. Mediation. What is mediation? Let's start <clears throat> by defining this even in secular terms. Mediation <clears throat> is typically defined as when a person intervenes between two other persons or two other parties for the sake of unity. And we're certainly familiar with forms of governmental or, or labor or business mediation. But we want to get to the heart of the meaning of the term. Mediation comes from the Greek word mesetis, which literally means go-between. A mediator is a go-between, one who intervenes. But the goal of the mediator is union. Now, it's important to point out that spiritual mediation can sometimes have the opposite impact of physical mediation. What I mean by that is, let's say you have two people right next to each other, and a third person comes up and says, well, I'm going to be a go-between between you two physically, so one move over and the other move over this way, and I'm going to get in between you. Well, that seems to at least physically distance the two. Spiritual mediation, my friends, is the opposite. Spiritual mediation only unites hearts. It unites the two parties without any desire, intention, or effect of bringing people farther apart. And this is very important, uh, I think, in, in properly understanding the objections to the idea of Mary as a mediatrix, or even, in some cases, the saints or the angels, with the fear, the fear that if I invoke Mary, I'm distancing myself from Jesus. Uh, she's getting in, not only in between, but in the way. She's moving me back. So let's go now to the proper theological understanding of mediation and also the revelation of Scripture. Now before we do that, I just want to say one last word about the, phys the uh, philosophical uh, effect of mediation. Philosoph philosophers will say that when you participate 
as something inferior in something that is greater than itself, that participation is a mediation. But keep in mind, once again, when something inferior participates in something perfect or superior, that is a mediation, but it doesn't, it never, the inferior mediator, the inferior participant, never reaches the perfection of the perfect mediator. And so that's the concept of participation again, to cooperate as an inferior in something superior. This will bear fruit in our discussion about the one mediation of Christ. Well, my friends, if you have not yet had this passage of Scripture quoted to you, you certainly will, uh, if you're in any context of uh, being identified as a Catholic or in Catholic dialogue. And that is 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5. And the term that comes forth from 1 Timothy 2.5 is, of course, that critical term, mesites, mediator. St. Paul says, quote, For there is one God, and there is one mediator, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, first of all, in the text, when they talk about one mediator between God and man, in the Greek there are two words for one, uh, monos and eis. Monos means one and only one. Eis means first, first of many, primary of a multitude in some cases. So it's the ace, the first among many, not the monos, the exclusive, the one and only that is used in the text. What is St. Paul teaching positively and what is he prohibiting? There's a, there's a brilliant Wednesday audience by Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, October 1st, uh, 1997. And the Holy Father really gives a commentary on 1 Timothy 2.5. And this is what he says. He said, St. Paul is only condemning parallel or rival mediation to the one mediation of Christ. He is in no sense condemning participation in the one mediation of Christ. Go back to philosophy for a second. Remember, participation is where an, an inferior uh, being or entity, participates in the perfection of a superior being. So St. Paul, St. John Paul II rightly tells us, is not prohibiting subordinate mediation in the one mediation of Christ. He's, he's a, a properly prohibiting any concept of equal mediation, which is blasphemy and heresy. And it has always been such for a Catholic understanding of mediation. Jesus is the one mediator to the Father. You only get to the Father through Jesus Christ, period. Now, what about the possibility of others participating, inferior creatures participating in the perfect mediation of Jesus Christ? And this also, I think, is, a, is a, at least in part, the brainchild of St. John Paul II. In times of past, it was at least um, significantly used uh, this, this idea that you would kind of line up your mediators. First would be Jesus, of course, uh, then would be Mary, then St. Joseph, and then various angels and saints, and holy souls in purgatory. They, of course, can intercede, right? So it's kind of a line of mediators based on their ability to mediate, the power of their mediation. And I'm not saying this was the only model of mediation, but it was certainly used. St. John Paul II encouraged and confirmed the idea of, no, let's talk about the one mediation of Jesus, and then let's talk about different levels of participation in that one mediation. And what's the fruit of that, my friends? The fruit of that is it keeps clear and undaunted and, and, and pure the fact that everyone gets to the Father through Jesus. The, the, the ongoing question is, can others participate in that one mediation? Well, let's go to Scripture. And let's see if we can find examples of God-appointed mediators who are creatures. Because we want to, from the get-go here, from the beginning, we want to take away this idea that God is not going to use creatures to mediate between his people and himself. It, that would be, in the minds of some, uh, idolatry. 
Why is that not idolatry? And why, in fact, do we have several key scriptural examples of where God will designate creatures to mediate between himself and his people? Well, let's go over the examples first. First of all, in the Old Testament, we have the patriarchs. And the patriarchs are unquestionably God instituted mediators between himself and his chosen people. There are dramatic examples of this. For example, the example of Moses, when Moses is told by God to, to extend his hands, and if his hands are extended, the Israelites will defeat the Amalekites. But if his hands drop, then his people will start losing on the battlefield. Well, that at first, especially to a non-Christian, to someone who doesn't accept revelation, might say, well, what absurdity. You're going to have people, men dying or living on the battlefield based on the position of that guy's arms? What's the purpose? The purpose is that Moses prefigures Christ with his hands extended as the one great meter, mediator through whom all of us must pass in the order of grace to get to the Father. So Moses is clearly... Uh, a mediator between God and man, and he's a creature, as we know, as are the other patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc., and all those to whom the Father will effectively establish a covenant between himself and his people. So first of all, we have the patriarchs. Secondly, we have the prophets. What are the prophets? But God instituted vehicles, oracles, by which the people can hear God's word for what? For the sake of union. Uh, keep in mind as we discuss this, the classic definition of mediation. Someone's intervening to unite. That's what the prophets are doing. And oftentimes the prophets were killed because they did not compromise this message, which oftentimes took the form of a warning or an admonition. Prophets are created, God-appointed mediators. Now, some might object, well, that's fine, that's Old Testament, that's before we get Jesus. Once we get Jesus, we don't need any more creaturely mediation. That, again, would be erroneous against Scripture and apostolic tradition. For example, the third great category of mediators are the angels. Now, the angels are creatures. Uh, oftentimes, they're, they're messengers of God. Oftentimes, they are uh, directly uh, established by God to be forms of intercession. And in fact, we see even after the Incarnation, the angels are prominent in the New Testament. So once again, and what are they doing? They're participating in the one mediation of Christ, as we'll talk about in a few moments, and how that's done. So we have to, um, initially, as a Christian, we have to uh, eliminate this idea that God can't, use creatures to mediate. Uh, there's a great quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. This is from uh, the Tares, the third part of the Summa, question 26, article 1, uh, where St. Thomas rightly says, and I quote, Christ alone is the perfect mediator between God and man, but there is nothing to prevent others in a certain way from being called mediator between God and man insofar as they by preparing or serving, cooperate in uniting men to God. Of course. Did you pray for your mother and father or your children today? Guess what? You were a mediator. Are you parallel to Jesus? Of course not. Are you competing with him? Of course not. But you're sharing in his mediation. If you're praying for your children in any Christian form, you're going through Christ, the one mediator. And we'll see... Uh, or we could at least maintain that even those who don't know they're going through Christ the one mediator, if they're, if they're reaching, anybody who reaches the Father is reaching the Father through Christ the one mediator. Obviously, there's going to be greater efficacy if you're doing so with the realization that Jesus is the one mediator. All right, now let's take this uh, in, in a different direction and let's try to observe and, and examine the why the principal objection to the idea of having secondary mediators. And I think to be fair to, to many Christians who are not Catholic, who, who find the idea of praying to Mary or Mary mediating or St. Joseph or any of the saints or, or even angels, although most 
uh, Christian bodies accept the role of the angels and even the intercession of the angels. Uh, and again, keeping in mind the reference in, in Revelations about the prayer of the saints rising like incense before God. Mediation, creaturely mediation, is biblical. Uh, incidentally, I want to point out, uh, again, uh, one of the brilliant elements of St. John Paul II's commentary. In 1 Timothy 2.5, uh, St. John Paul II makes reference that before 1 Timothy 2.5 happens with, with Christ the one mediator, you have 1 Timothy 2.1. Well, what does 1 Timothy 2.1 say? That is where St. Paul calls all Christians for prayers, intercessions, supplications, one for another. St. John Paul II asks the simple question, is this not a form of mediation? Of course it is. But let's go back to the, to the major objection, and I want to put it in a question form. Here's the question. Does the participation of others in the one mediation of Christ, A, diminish the glory of Jesus, or B, manifest the glory of Jesus. Once again, if people are participating, going back to our philosophical definition, right, the participation of something inferior in something superior, if people are participating in the one mediation of Jesus, does that diminish the glory of Jesus as one possibility, or on the other hand, does it manifest the glory? Well, let's talk about a couple examples where all Christians must participate in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. And let's start with the discussion of grace. What is grace? The best definition of grace we have is grace, sanctifying grace, is a participation in the life and the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when you're baptized in sanctifying grace, you are participating in the life of Jesus so that you can participate in the life of the Trinity. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And he's the one mediation. So you're baptized into Christ Jesus, and that allows you uh, to participate in the one mediation of Jesus. And in fact, you must be baptized to participate in the one mediation. And it's also true to say that uh, anybody who is baptized must participate in the one mediation of Jesus to live in grace. Another concept of, of where we have to participate in something unique of Jesus is the scripture uh, and biblical concept of, of sonship. Now remember, there's only one true son of, jo of God. Uh, one true son of God generated, uh, in the sense, uh, the technical term, begotten of the Father. And that's Jesus. That's the word made flesh, right? So the rest of us, as St. Paul tells us, we are all adopted sons and daughters. Okay. So that means all of us technically have to participate in what is unique of Jesus. That is his sonship. We are participating, inferior beings, in a perfection of a superior being, Jesus Christ. So we must, to be saved, we must become adopted sons and daughters. And insofar as we're doing that, we are participating in what is unique of Jesus Christ. Third example from Scripture. Priesthood. How many high priests are there? Well, there's only one high priest, as Hebrew tells us. The one high priest is Jesus Christ. And yet, as St. Peter will teach us in his letter, we are all called to the royal priesthood of the laity. And what does that mean? It means we are all called to do what a priest is supposed to do in the defining element of priesthood, which is to offer sacrifice for the people. No one does that like Jesus Christ. You don't just take the number of sacrifices priests make and put them together and get close to Jesus. Jesus is the one high priest. And when a, when a priest properly offers sacrifice for the people, and the height of that being the sacrifice of the Mass, he's only participating in the perfection of Jesus as the one high priest. Well, this is true for every single Christian. As uh, Peter says in his letter, we all must offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. That's why, incidentally, it's so great in families and in homes, in, in Christian homes, that you have an altar, you have a family altar. And the kids know when we go there, we're offering sacrifices of prayers and intercessions uh, to Jesus. Uh, 
we are being priests in the general sense of the, the common priest or the laity. So, whether it be ordained priesthood, which is obviously ontologically and, and objectively a higher level of participating in the one priesthood of Jesus, or whether we are priests in the order of priesthood of laity, every baptized Christian must participate in the one priesthood of Jesus. You get the idea, this idea that Jesus is one and perfect and we participate in it. So let's get back to our question. Does it, A, diminish the glory of Jesus to have people participating in it, or B, does it manifest the glory of it? And I, again, I mention this because many of our Christian brothers and sisters think that if anybody participates, it's going to diminish the glory of Jesus. No one wants that. No good Christian wants that. No authentic Catholic wants the, dimin the, uh, the diminishing of the glory of Jesus. So, which is it, A or B? Well, my friends, think of a world where no one is in grace, no one has been baptized, so that Jesus can be alone in his mediation. That doesn't manifest the glory of Jesus. Secondly, think of a world where no one is an adopted son or daughter of Christ. Jesus is the only begotten son, and he's exclusively and only the only begotten son. Does that manifest the glory of Jesus? Of course not. That's barren. That's, that's an absence of the full appreciation and the manifestation of, of who Jesus is as the one Son. Thirdly, a world with no priests, no ordained priests, no priests of the lady, no sacrifices. See, that's what takes away the glory. That's what takes away the manifestation of his glory. His glory in itself is, a, in, is infinite, but in terms of us appreciating and the world seeing his glory for the sake of the salvation of all? No, the answer is B, my friends. This is the beautiful Christian, more the merrier principle. The more people participate in the one mediation of Jesus, the more his glory is manifest. And it's critically important we get that. The more that say yes and are baptized into Christ and share in his priesthood and share in his mission of salvation and share as co-redeemers with Jesus, the one Redeemer, the more His glory is manifest. And that's why, as we said before, the principle is that you know, every saint is a masterpiece of God. So let's conclude this in regards to Our Lady. Mary, as St. John Paul II says in Redemptoris Mater, Mary uniquely participates in the one mediation of Christ. Mary alone and exclusively participates on a certain level, which is unequaled by any other creature. So, of course, Mary doesn't participate exclusively in the sense that it allows or disallows, properly said, that it prohibits others to participate in the one mediation of Jesus. No, she uniquely participates in this glorious mediation, and therefore, she uniquely manifests the glory of the one mediation of Christ. No, no competition, my friends. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if you had mother and son competing with each other? Uh, what hurts the heart of a mother more than uh, the idea that she's overshadowing her son? This is, this is, this is so anti-natural uh, as opposed to the co-naturality of a mother wishing to manifest the glory of her son. In any case, metaphysically, theologically, philosophically, Mary's unique participation in the one mediation of Jesus Christ helps to manifest the glory of Jesus, not to diminish it. And in this next lecture, we're going to talk about the ways by which she concretely does that. And we're going to begin with her role as co-redemptrix. And we're going to see once again that as Jesus is the one redeemer, Mary uniquely shares in that one redemptive act and on a third level, each of us, every member of the person of God, every member of the church as the people of God, properly said, everyone is called to participate in the redemption of others. Jesus the Redeemer, Mary the Co-Redemptrix, we as Co-Redeemers. That's how, as we will see, Mary uniquely participates 
in the one mediation of Jesus, and how she will consequently share in the distribution of grace as the mediatrix of all graces, and in bringing the needs of humanity back to the throne of Christ as the advocate for all peoples. 